it looks like um, Facebook Live is loading as a bit of an update for um, you all. So it should just be another minute or so. I think we're gonna get started uh, in the interest of time because I wanna respect all the time that you guys have today and we appreciate you being with us. Um, so I'll get started and hopefully the, the Facebook Live connects at some point. We'll see how it goes. So, hi, happy International Day for Biological Diversity. And uh, if you're just joining us now, then welcome to the Ecology Action Center's second webinar series, which of course is dedicated to biodiversity today. Um, my name is Dana Lipnicki, and I'm the Community Giving Manager. And um, as well, I'm also gonna be your host for the day, lucky you. Uh, Hope Perez and Rowan Swain are also working with us behind the scenes to uh, take care of all the technical logistics. So thank you so much to both of them. Um, we would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging the fact that we're gathering online today across the province on unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory. As we discuss issues of our shared environment, climate change and justice, it's critical to remember our relationship to this land and to follow the leadership from the Mi'kmaq people and their continued relationship to this land, Mi'kmaq, since time immemorial. Most of us are visitors here on this territory, so we ask that we all consider this as we continue with today's webinar. So for those of you who are tuning in right now and might not be too familiar with our work, the Ecology Action Center is a member-based environmental charity officially located here in Halifax, although again, of course, we're coming to you remotely from across the province today. The EAC takes leadership on critical environmental issues, everything from biodiversity protection to climate change to environmental justice. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of our agenda for the day. We encourage you to attend all of the sessions, uh, but if you're unable to, I'll let you know how this afternoon will roll out. And I'll let you know as well, we are planning on um, sending out a recording afterwards as long as everything goes smoothly. So beginning shortly, we're gonna hear from three staff members who care deeply about biodiversity across our beautiful province and beyond. Um, so they're gonna engage and educate us for about 15 minutes, and then there'll be some time to answer some questions from you, our wonderful captive audience. Karen McKendry is going to be kicking us off with a fascinating conversation on the intersection of experiencing multiple crises, the value of biodiversity, and where we can find hope amidst this. Around 1.30, Meredith Baldwin will um, be discussing the roles that cities and of course the people within them play in preserving and protecting biodiversity. Uh, there is a big opportunity for this in Halifax right now and this promises to be quite an engaging conversation. And then to wrap up the day, at 2 p.m., we're going to dive deep into our ocean playground with Jordy Thompson and uh, learn how marine protected air areas are critical in preserving the biodiversity that we might not see every day. And you don't want to miss this. As I mentioned already, we do plan to save some room at the end of presentations for questions, so please don't be shy. We love hearing from you. Uh, our presenters are excited to answer all of your questions about the topics they're presenting on. Um, we might not have time for all of your questions, but hopefully we can get through most of them. Uh, I do ask that please make sure that your question is related to the presentation in the interest of time and so that we can get the most out of the webinar today. You can just write your questions in the question box below if you're on Zoom. And uh, it, I don't know if we're on Facebook Live or not, but uh, you can write in the chat if you're on Facebook Live and watching this. <laughs> Uh, so today on the International Day for Biological Diversity, we at the EAC thought that this was an opportunity to celebrate the work that we've only been able to do because of you, um, our members, our supporters, and our general community. As a member-based organization, we would truly not be the force that we are today if it wasn't for the support of over 5,000 individuals who recognize the need to be doing more to protect, to protect our planet and the incredible diversity of life that exists within it. So thank you from all of us um, for your support because we really couldn't do it without you. And if you aren't already a member of the Ecology Action Center, please consider joining today. 
a small monthly donation really goes a long way in supporting this important work. And the more people that join us as members really only helps to amplify our collective voice and create greater change for the environment at a time where it is very, very critical. Um, as well, if you sign up as a new member during the webinar, I'll try to give you a special shout out to say thank you. Um, if you're already a member, thank you. <laughs> and of course, we uh, are always happy to accept additional donations. But we're so grateful that you're, you're a member and, and that just brings so much joy to our hearts. Um, all of the memberships and donations given today and every day, of course, can continue our work. Um, and so in advance, thank you so much for your generous support. Um, okay, so let's get started. As promised, our first presenter of the day is Karen McKendry. Karen is our Wilderness Outreach Coordinator here at the Ecology Action Center, and she's going to be speaking today about the implications of multiple crises that we're being faced with. So from COVID-19 to the climate crisis to uh, the biodiversity crisis, she describes this as a triple threat to the sustainability of our province and believes that amidst this, we can still find hope. So thank you so much for being here today, Karen, and I'll let you take it away. Oh, thank you for that introduction, Dana. So to get started today, I wanted to set some common ground for our talk. So I look forward to hearing about biodiversity in cities from my colleague Meredith Baldwin and learning about the lush life in our marine waters from my colleague Jordy Thompson. But I'm going to focus just on terrestrial biodiversity in Nova Scotia. Also, each of the three people speaking today will use the word biodiversity, which is the short form of the phrase biological diversity. This term has many meanings, but a growing consensus is settling on its meaning as simply the variety of life, but usually thought of at three scales, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. Today, we're going to focus mostly on species diversity, which has seen unprecedented decline in our lifetime. I'm going to share my screen. So the crises keep piling up the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. I have to admit, I had been feeling the climate crisis kind of stole the spotlight from the biodiversity decline in the last few years. Like many of us had already been sounding the alarm about biodiversity loss for decades before everyone became woke and declared climate change as the defining issue of our time. So I've calmed down a bit about it and I can actually now see the interwovenness of them all. But exhaustingly, we can't work on one crisis at a time. We have to work on all of them simultaneously. Fortunately, the barriers to making huge advances are known, and some of the solutions to the crises are the same. And there's reason for hope. The number one threat to biodiversity is and has been habitat loss, but climate change is rising on the list of causes of decline. So just a few ways climate change affects biodiversity is through rapid changes in temperatures and the physical environment more rapidly than species can adapt. For example, the loss of sea ice in the Arctic, which is already affecting polar bears. Shifts in the onset of migration and breeding coupled with changes in food availability, such as insects, can affect populations negatively. And species ranges are changing, causing new interactions in the regions they expand into. So in this map, in the dark red, you can see the part of the United States where spring leaf out, which is just happening here, it occurred three to four weeks earlier this year than it used to in the 1980s. So this has implications for plants, insects, birds, both native and introduced. And there's a feedback loop. When biodiverse ecosystems are bulldozed or collapsed, they stop doing the great job they were doing of trapping carbon. They often release a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere when they're destroyed. For example, the Amazon rainforest, which contains an amount of carbon equivalent to a decade of human global emissions, 20% um, of that biome has already been lost, permanently converted to something else. When an area is deforested, its carbon is ultimately released and its carbon capturing potential is stopped. 
Currently, forests capture one third of all carbon emitted by humans each year. We can't afford to lose more biologically diverse forests if we want to have any hope of reaching our climate change emission targets. Forests are proving to be the best terrestrial carbon capture technology available, but just 2% of international climate finance goes to forests, while subsidies and investments in sectors driving deforestation amount to 40 times more than investments in protecting forests. This needs to change if we're gonna realize the full potential of forests for trapping carbon. What can we do here about this roadblock? Nova Scotia is covered in forests. What an amazing opportunity to make contributions to both addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. Money is a strong motivator for our species. So I offer you this quote and then a question. So if this is what we're up against, how do we use financial incentives in Nova Scotia to motivate forest destruction versus how are we using financial incentives to motivate forest protection? Conserving biodiversity, especially in our forests, could help with the climate crisis. But beyond that, is there any reason to be concerned about biodiversity loss in and of itself? I mean, what has biodiversity done for you lately? So one way to think about the value or worth of biodiversity is through the ecosystem services it delivers, or another way of putting it is nature's contributions to people. These can be thought of in four categories. Provisioning services, that's where biodiversity provides directly the items we need, such as food or timber or medicine. Regulating services, which is where biodiversity is part of ecosystem processes that need that to function properly, like water purification, erosion control, and pollination. Cultural services can sometimes be overlooked, but biodiversity supports spiritual practices, recreation, and mental health. And all of these services in turn are possible thanks to underlying supporting services like evolution and nutrient cycling and primary productivity. When our ecosystem services are degraded, we're in trouble in a lot of ways. Loss of ecosystem services has powerful impacts on our society and our economy. So how are ecosystem services doing? Well, a landmark report was released last May about global biodiversity and ecosystem services decline, but this global report can be heated at a local scale. This is the one written by the IPBES. They're like the IPCC of the world, but for biodiversity. It was a report that warned of a million species at risk of extinction in our lifetime. The IPBES report for the Americas region found that the American continents host just 13% of the global human population, but we produce 23% of the global ecological footprint. We've made some progress on protected areas in our corner of the world, but we really need to stop degrading ecosystems in the working landscape. 65% of ecosystem services in our region are declining. What can be done here in Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq, to try to turn the tide on the biodiversity crisis? Well, biodiversity in Nova Scotia is in trouble too, I think. I'm actually not sure because as a province, we have no biodiversity act, no biodiversity status report and no biodiversity plan. No one really knows what we have left. Although biodiversity is considered a fundamental pillar of our natural resources, we have not seen strong political leadership on addressing our impaired life support system, in my opinion. We have a list of more than 70 species at risk that are in the ICU, the most critical condition they can be in. But what about the other species in Nova Scotia? What's our plan for keeping common species common? And how do we stop sending more species to the ICU? Well, Ecology Action Center and East Coast Environmental Law caught wind that the province was planning to introduce a biodiversity act. And so we put our heads together and asked, what would stop the loss of species and degradation of environmental services in Nova Scotia? What would be good elements to have in a biodiversity act? What have other states and provinces done and what specifically needs to be addressed here? We asked other biodiversity conservation practitioners and environmental law experts their views on what would make for a strong act. And we shared what we learned and ultimately what we came to recommend with the province of Nova Scotia in a joint report. The wording of the biodiversity act has now seen the light of day, but the act has actually not been passed into law. From what we've seen, the act has some tools to enforce regulations on crown land and private land for activities that would obviously be destructive for biodiversity, like stopping people who are introducing invasive species. 
but it's not the ambitious act that we need for the pivotal times we live in. The IPBES report calls for transformative change to address threats to biodiversity. So what exactly do they mean by that? Well, they literally defined it. Quote, by transformative change, we mean a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. The Biodiversity Act for Nova Scotia, as it stands now, does not speak of transformative change. It puts a couple of traditional tools in the enforcement toolbox, but it's not talking about system-wide changes to natural resource management. It does commit to a state of biodiversity report in five years, but no other promises are made. I hope that there's still room to improve this act in order to truly help all the non-human relations we have in Nova Scotia and ultimately ourselves too. Across terrestrial Nova Scotia, we're seeing changes in species diversity. Changes in species ranges have possibly been accelerated here by warming winter temperatures over the last few decades. Two examples I can think of that are especially problematic for humans are the range expansion of Lyme disease carried by black-legged ticks and hemlock woolly adelgid, which is posed to, poised to wipe out a central tree species in our Acadian forest. Land use change has been identified as the leading driver of recently emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19. Deforestation for intensive agriculture and for extractive industries such as logging and mining are causing both biodiversity loss and contributing to the emergence and spread of infectious disease. What Pandora's boxes do we risk opening in Nova Scotia as we keep edging into wildlife habitat, right while wildlife habitat itself is undergoing changes? One of the sad, ironic things to emerge from the COVID-19 outbreak in Nova Scotia is the risk we now pose to bats. That's right. Departments of Lands and Forestry shared national guidance that people who may interact with native bat species for research or for removal from human occupied buildings should now try to avoid contact with bats because of the risk that we might infect them with COVID-19, which could further decimate bat populations which are already at risk. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and now pandemics are crises demanding our attention. Can we work on all of them at the same time? Is transformative change possible for societies in 2020? Yes, apparently. I mean, look at so many aspects of the responses to the pandemic. Supply chains can change. Pollution can change. Wildlife can change. People can change. And I think Nova Scotia can change. It's been a tumultuous couple of months. For me, that's meant I've been ruminating a lot, reading a lot, talking to my partner a lot, and fluctuating between feeling lost and feeling hopeful. What gives me hope? Well, here's three reasons for hope that we can make the transformative changes that we need to. The first is a global reason for hope, and that's the hole in the ozone layer. So in case your memory has gotten fuzzy or you didn't grow up in the 1980s, here's a recap. Our current crises are not the first global catastrophe we face. In the 1970s, scientists discovered that chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, released from aerosol sprays and refrigerators were creating a hole in the ozone layer, our planet's sunscreen. UV rays were cascading in with the potential to cause massive increases in skin cancer, not to mention effects on wildlife. But no, don't deprive me of my hairspray. Of course, over the next 20 years, a familiar set of scenes played out. Science was attacked, industries lawyered up, and they were effective at bogging down policy change for decades. Ultimately, thanks to lobbying by scientists, environmental groups, and even environmental agencies within government, national policies to phase out CFCs were committed to. And in 1987, the international treaty that phases out CFCs, called the Montreal Protocol, was signed. Every country on earth is now a signatory to this treaty, and it's working. Not only did banning CFCs help to stop the thinning of the ozone layer, from 2005 to 2015, the hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctic shrunk by 20%. This image shows essentially the thickness of the ozone layer from before we started to destroying it to the heady days of the 1970s and 80s and the impact on the following decades to the prediction that it will return to pre-damaged conditions by mid-century. It's working. We can do this, people. 
Now, I know I said we have to get a handle on how much we degrade ecosystems on the working landscape, but until we're better behaved, we're going to need official protected areas. These are the places where nature comes first, where the management for the needs of biodiversity comes before the wants of humans. Protected areas have been shown to harbor higher species diversity and larger wildlife populations than outside protected areas. They are part of saving our remaining biodiversity. And they also contribute to climate change adaptation. Canada is emerging as a global leader in protected areas, as we should be. We are home to 20% of the Earth's forest, 24% of its wetlands, and almost one third of its land stored carbon. We committed to protecting 17% of the country as protected areas by the end of this year, and we may reach that target on time. Beyond that, Canada committed to 30% protection by 2030 in policy and is expected to urge other countries to follow suit. That's ambitious. This graph shows global progress on protected areas from a low of 8% 30 years ago to just about 15% today. Canada has also added about 15% and we're proposing to double that in just the next 10 years. There's also talk of planning for protecting 50% of Canada by 2050. Now that is a Canada I look forward to living in. Now here's a very local story of a reason for hope. Peregrine falcons are amazing birds. They're the fastest flying animal in the world when they do their trademark dive. But their populations went through a precipitous decline in the 1960s for the same reason as eagles, condors, and other avian top predators. The pesticide DDT would get into the birds, causing their eggshells to become thin and then break under the weight of a mother bird. By 1975, not a single peregrine was spotted east of Alberta in concentrated surveys. Bans and restrictions on DDT ensued, but was it too late? Not willing to give up, several Canadian wildlife departments, including the Nova Scotia Department of Lands and Forests, partnered to create a captive breeding program. A breeding facility in Wainwright, Alberta, provided 105 peregrines to Nova Scotia in the 1980s. Each one housed and fed in nests without parents and then fledged at sites along the Bay of Fundy. At first, surveys found no evidence of breeding peregrines in Nova Scotia. The province then also made a recovery plan for the species, investigated sightings, and protected potential nesting habitat, but it didn't bring the peregrines back. Finally, in 1995, after 40 years of effort, the first sightings of a peregrine mother with chicks occurred in Nova Scotia, spotted by a lands and forest biologist who was especially dedicated to recovering the species. Since then, 11 more peregrine pairs have established territories in Nova Scotia. It's one of the only species I know of that has moved down the species at risk list from endangered in 1978 to threatened in 1999 to not at risk in 2017. If I ever need to find my sense of find a sense of hope again, I just look out my window. In some years, a pair of peregrines nest in the Dingle Tower in Halifax, which I can see from my house. One thing that's emerged quite clearly in response to the pandemic in Nova Scotia is that Nova Scotians love their outdoor spaces and they don't want to be kept from them. At EAC, I got plenty of messages from people who wanted to follow the orders of our provincial leaders and stay the blazes home, yet they felt they were being deprived of access to parks and trails cut off from a vital health and wellness resource for them, time in nature. People seem to realize more deeply what connecting with biodiversity does for them on a personal level. I feel like a fascinating and important thing to emerge from this pandemic is that individual people and societies are getting crystal clear on their values and how they want to live them. A recent national poll by Ecos Politics found that when the COVID-19 crisis ends, 73% of Canadians expect we will undergo a broad transformation of our society. Almost three quarters of Canadians are ready for transformative change. Are you? I will leave you with a question related to this in the poll. The poll question is gonna be, what transformative change do you think we need to initiate in Nova Scotia right now to save and restore our biodiversity? I've put some suggestions in the poll, but there's also room for you to put your ideas in the chat. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, if you guys just wanna 
fill out the poll. We'll just give you a couple seconds to do that. So what transformative change do you think that we need to initiate in Nova Scotia right now to save and restore our biodiversity? So you can vote. Um, we've got transform our forestry practices towards ecological forestry for real. Get a handle on our biodiversity through a state of biodiversity report and a plan to manage biodiversity. Ramp up protected area designations to get to a level that supports biodiversity conservation and engage every Nova Scotian in our shared biodiversity through education and volunteering opportunities. Or other, if you'd like to write in the chat. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds for that, maybe 10 more seconds. Okay. All right, so these are the poll results right here. So uh, Karen, can you see this? I can. Looks like transform our forestry practices towards ecological forestry for real uh, is the winner in this poll. So maybe you want to speak on that for just a minute. We are uh, probably going to go till 140, so just a, a little less than five minutes before we move on to the next presentation. Sure, so there's been a call from the public, from scientists, from environmental groups to change our forestry practices in Nova Scotia for a long time. The most recent formal call for change was the Leahy Report, uh, introduced by Bill Leahy and a, and a team of people that examined forestry practices, so it had a certain set scope. And his independent review was released uh, almost two years ago this summer. And the government said they, the provincial government said they would adopt it, but they've been very slow to seriously implement any of the recommendations in the report. So my colleague, Ray Plourd, is deeply involved in that. He attends many meetings where people, including forestry industry leaders, go over the recommendations and talk about how to implement them. Unfortunately, um, they're kind of starting with the wrong end. They're not doing a deep dive into what do we fundamentally have to change about our laws and our practices and how do we think about the forest. And focus recently has been on high production forestry. What areas can we forest uh, or harvest in a more intense way than we have before? So I think we're looking for a sea change and we're starting um, at the bottom <laughs> where, where uh, things are not moving very quickly. Yeah. Stella is wondering um, about signing petitions or writing letters about Bill 116. Um, and wondering what opportunities uh, we have as members of EAC to um, help motivate others to take action and to create change. So I wish I could direct you on the Biodiversity Act right now, but it's in a weird kind of purgatory. So it, the bill was introduced and then myself and, and Lisa at East Coast Environmental Law thought for the first time and could figure out you know, what related to our recommendations and what was, was pretty different than what we were hoping for. It went to first reading in the provincial legislature, second reading, and then law amendments where members of the public can come and speak about it, uh, which we did and, and other people did. And then the normal progression after that is to go to third reading and then, and then become law. And it was pulled at the 11th hour. And so I don't actually even know in the legislative process where it would come back in. I don't know if there'll be uh, more consultations on it. There were some consultations last summer. I never heard you know, whether those were taken seriously. So it's in a kind of like limbo right now where I thought it was the government's intent to introduce it. What they put forward, I felt had some good ideas, but fell short of what I think we need in 2020. And so I don't know if it's going to get a rewrite or not. So stay tuned to, to EAC. And when that comes forward again, we'll let you know. Great. And uh, last question really quickly. Um, oh, we got two from Rachel. It's a double question. So uh, Rachel's curious about what kinds of transformative system changes uh, you think would be successful for Nova Scotia and also how do you feel education should best engage students on the issue of biodiversity? So mm. that. <laughs> yeah, you touched on a subject I'm very passionate about which is environmental education and actually one of our recommendations was to include biodiversity education in the curriculum in Nova Scotia. So that's already a Canadian commitment to the Convention on Biodiversity. So one of the IG targets um, that Canada committed to was putting biodiversity education in the curriculum in every province and territory. And almost every province and territory has done that, except for Nova Scotia. 
So I feel like that could be a transformative change. If we're telling students at every grade level that understanding your connection to the natural world is a, is a basic part of your education, I think that's part of the sea change we need. I have to admit now that I, so I'm a parent, I have a seven year old and a nine year old. And so I'm, I'm doing the homeschooling with them that their teachers send. And I super appreciate the job that their teachers are doing. And they're directed to focus on a sort of more constrained uh, aspect of what they would be teaching. And so the priorities are reading, writing and math with some time for music and phys ed. But I didn't say anything about nature or biodiversity in there. So that kind of betrays what our society feels like it has to prepare our kids for. So I think a transformative change, which is straightforward, would be to include biodiversity education in every grade level in the curriculum in Nova Scotia. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. Um, that was so interesting and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to everyone here for being a part of our very special Ecology Action Center Biodiversity webinar. Mm -hmm. So if you're just joining us now, uh, once again, my name is Dana. I'm the Community Giving Manager at EAC as well as your host uh, for today for our first ever Biodiversity Day webinar. Uh, I hope that you'll feel energized by everything that you're learning today and that you can pass along this knowledge to a friend or a family member. And uh, I also wanted to say that if you're liking what you're hearing on the webinar today and you're in a position to do so, uh, we would love to have you join us as a member of the Ecology Action Center. Uh, membership is the backbone of our work at the EAC, and it's because of our members that we're able to do the important work of advocating for biodiversity protection. Um, thank you so much today to all of our members for making this webinar possible. And if you'd like to join as a member today, simply click the link in the chat below, which will be provided for you. Uh, our next speaker today is Meredith Baldwin who is our Sustainable Cities Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center. By 2050, nearly 70% of the world is estimated to be living in cities, which poses a significant threat to biodiversity, but also presents many opportunities. Meredith will be debunking some common and greenwashed urban biodiversity techniques and discuss practical changes that we can make from a policy, infrastructural, and personal level from a Halifax perspective. As a reminder, at the end of Meredith's presentation, we hope to have some time to take some questions from the audience. So please write your questions for her in the Q&A box on your screen, or um, if we're on Facebook Live, then you can write that in a comment. Now, without further ado, here's Meredith. Welcome, Meredith. Hello, everybody. I am really excited to get to talk to you about biodiversity in cities today. And so I'm going to just go and switch on the presentation. And we are actually going to start with a question. Um, and for that question, I would love to hear, where do you live? Uh, do you live in what you consider to be a city or a suburb uh, or a more rural area? and the polls will be up. So I'm interested in seeing where you are. Um, I mean, I know some people showed a little bit earlier today that they're on a back deck um, or a few different parts of Nova Scotia that you're in, but it'll be really interesting because we are talking about cities and more urban environments today to see how many people who are tuning in are living in one and how many people are living outside of one. Okay, so we have the polls um, and it seems that just a bit over half of us are living in a city. Um, a little bit below 20% are living in a suburb and about 30% living in a rural area, which is actually interesting. So this is somewhat close to how uh, Nova Scotia is kind of split up. Nova Scotia is one of the provinces in Canada that does tend towards more rural and suburban living. Um, but as a whole, a lot of our population around the world and in Canada is moving towards cities. So as Dana shared, 
by 2050, nearly 70% of the global population will be living in cities. And in Canada, we are actually already at 80% of our population um, who is classified to be living in a city right now. That's a significant amount and we're ahead of the global norm already. And so whether you are somebody who's living in a city right now, whether you work in one or go to one to shop, cities are a huge part of our life and that's only going to be growing. So the thing about living in urban environments is that often a lot of what we classify as living in a city is actually sprawl. So in this map, you can see that in the time of about two decades, HRM nearly doubled in the size that we are taking up, but only increased in population by a fifth, which means that we are sprawling quite fast. <laughs> we actually, in this time, lost density in our urban core. And this makes sense. It's a trend that's happening across Canada. If our cities aren't built well, uh, if there's insufficient policies guiding our growth, then living outside of them is appealing. You can maybe have more access to nature. It might be more affordable. Uh, you might have more control over where you live. And sometimes it's even easier to get around. But the thing is about this type of growth that if it continues and if it goes unmanaged, it can hurt us. It's the most resource intensive type of settlement. Uh, it takes over natural spaces because when we sprawl, we are sprawling on to what is natural, uh, what might be remaining. And that has a direct impact on biodiversity. Uh, so it's sprawling onto green life, perhaps wildlife corridors. And on top of that is, is also the most expensive to service. <laughs> So in terms of climate, this type of growth really can't continue. And we do need to make more dense urban centers work uh, in order to address the climate crisis. But the question is, how do we make biodiversity work for cities? So <laughs> this is a, a look from the top of a city and it shows a few of the problems that we often see in urban environments. Uh, it can be harder for native plants and animals to thrive, it is, because of the hard surfaces. You can look at this image and see if you can spot the grass or the green space in here. It's really hard to see and there is not much. Um, cities also change the local conditions uh, making something called the he urban heat island effect. And sometimes they introduce or support invasive species. They also result in very few natural spaces uh, like wetlands or wilderness remaining. This <laughs> shows in cities we often have this aestheticized or controlled version of nature, uh, which, which comes up as one type of flower that's not native to our area in planter beds around the city. And that's where you might see some form of nature. Um, and this, this highlights our overall problem in cities. They are taking away habitat and they're not incorporating native flora. Nature and cities right now are largely seen as separate. And this is something that I really think needs to be broken down. I think that we can incorporate nature into our cities uh, and these will help them be more biodiverse, more supportive of bio biodiversity and also more livable and enjoyable to spend time in. So luckily we have some ways that we have seen that cities can work uh, and some things that you might be able to do in your own house and some things that our municipality might be able to do. So grass <laughs> we've all seen it grass is absolutely everywhere i bet if you are sitting by a window which i am sitting right in front of one you can probably look out and spot grass somewhere outside it's on a lot of our medians it is on our lawns and our parks um, 
but what if we replaced it with grasses that were native to the areas that we're in? This can be beautiful. We may not need to cut it. Uh, and it can also help biodiversity in creating habitats for native fauna and also holding a native plant uh, in your yard or in your park. So there are many options to incorporate and we are going to play a little game and see if you can pick out, out of these three plants uh, which is not native to Nova Scotia. And so no, no Googling on this, but see if you can pick out which one is not native. And maybe if uh, you have seen any of these or have them growing in your lawn, you can always let us know in the chat too, if that would be interesting. All right, I think we are going to get to see the results. So we have about 65% saying the short on foxtail. Uh, and then it's about split between bull thistle and the Eastern mountain avens. Um, and so the answer <laughs> is the bull thistle, uh, which is loved by many pollinators, uh, still could be a great plant, but is not native to Nova Scotia. And so a lot of the plants that sometimes we get confused uh, between native uh, and naturalized. So naturalized is when they have been brought in and might do very well. Um, and the bull thistle is sometimes seen as that. <laughs> I was actually a little bit surprised doing this to find that the short horn foxtail is native to Nova Scotia. And I can pass along a resource after uh, which shows a huge catalog of all the different species that you could potentially plant in your lawn if you're interested um, and it can give you a lot more information to find some native species. There is also the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens at Acadia which uh, showcases many native species and, and different habitats and is a great place to take a look. So another option, in addition to lawns, uh, that we can change in our neighborhoods and our cities to bring biodiversity into them is bringing water back into our communities. So most cities had streams running through them and they had wetlands, uh, but humans got rid of them because they weren't favorable. Uh, and now we're left with, with very few. There's not many opportunities left to interact with water in our cities aside from uh, once we get kind of out of the dense urban core or, or if you're taking a look at the ocean. But bringing these, this water back into our life can bring habitat uh, and it can also enhance our living. It's lovely to have streams going through. And this is a project uh, in Malmö, Sweden where they daylit the streams through their community. And we have in Halifax started a similar thing with Sawmill River. So it will be really exciting to see that project finished and maybe investigate some more opportunities to bring water back into our communities. This is uh, essentially a wetland that was brought back into a community. So another option that we can influence is thinking about more permeable solutions. Uh, so kind of going the opposite direction of that image that I shared at the beginning, looking down at the city and all that you see is hard surfaces. Looking at opportunities for water to be absorbed uh, and where more plants could grow. You can do this in many ways in your own home and it's also something that some municipalities are incorporating. Now the last example that I will show, uh, I don't know if anybody has seen this building before. It's the Bosco Verticale in 
Milan, uh, sorry, in Milan, Italy. Uh, and it was widely celebrated for bringing nature into our cities for its contribution to biodiversity and livability. And this solution is, is quite far from natural. It's pretty resource intensive. If you think of the amount of resources that were needed to bring trees up onto this building, and in fact, to, to build a new building. Um, trees usually don't live 20 or 30 stories high, uh, straight on a building. And in terms of the benefits to humans, it really only benefits a few. It only benefits the people who are living in this unit uh, who can afford such an expensive solution. It's also for uh, many species, it's, it's very cut off. It is not at ground level. There are not gonna be many animals accessing uh, this, this land. And so it's really pretty, but it might not be a solution. And this is something that we need to look out for is the greenwashing of biodiversity, especially as we talk about solutions in cities. So real solutions, I would say, are generally cost effective. Uh, in some cases, they could even save money in the long term. They generally benefit the whole instead of benefiting just a few. Uh, and they often take an ecosystem approach. So they're not just thinking about this one specific building, but they're thinking about how does this tie into the greater picture. And so <laughs> the story is that we do need to live in cities and more and more people will be moving to cities. Cities are important in, in addressing the climate crisis that we're in. They're also important to make sure that we can protect wilderness that's on the fringe rather than developing into it, uh, like, the, like Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, which this photo is of. But if we are going to have this change, we need to make cities livable. And we need to start thinking about biodiversity in cities. So I hope you feel uh, a little bit inspired <laughs> with some solutions, what you might be able to do at home, uh, what you maybe can ask your elected officials to do. And now I, I know that some folks have been sharing in the chat, which is amazing. And I am happy to answer any questions. I would also love to hear what you're doing at home or in your neighborhood to address biodiversity in more urban environment. Thanks, Meredith. We do have a question and uh, it's from Stella. So Stella says, many cities encourage greening the roofs uh, on high rise buildings. Last year, Stella had the privilege of being invited uh, in the top of one of the high rise buildings in the new convention center and could see that there was very little happening, uh, very little of this happening in Halifax. Could this be encouraged? And if so, how? Absolutely. So green roofs are definitely an interesting solution to increasing biodiversity in our cities. Um, they are, yeah, not used in too many buildings around Halifax. Uh, the LEED certification and a few other certifications do require green roofs and require them specifically with native species, which is really interesting. And I think that is one way that we could make sure that they are brought a little bit more into our cities is making them a requirement if you're going to build a type of building, uh, incentivizing them a little bit more. But a really key part of that is making sure that they are functioning effectively. So making sure that the people who are using green roofs are incorporating native plants into them because that's not always how they get used and they can still be beautiful and enjoyable if they aren't incorporating native plants. But if you're able to do the two, that can really give a lot to, to biodiversity in the city. Cool. Um, Lara's ha Lara has a really interesting um, question here, something I've never actually heard of before. Maybe you have, Meredith. Lara says, I've seen posts about no mo may. Have you heard about this? And uh, would this help biodiversity? Yes, this is actually 
a very cool thing that I, I only heard about a couple of days ago. So in Toronto, and maybe it is happening in other cities, and that's, that's just the example that I've heard of right now, they're doing no mow May. And so they're encouraging residents to not mow their lawn, not mow away the dandelions or dig them up uh, and other plants that could be good for pollinators and just let it all grow in the city, which is a really easy start to a solution. It's also fantastic to see this encouraged on a community scale because even a decade back, we were getting upset for people for not mowing their lawn and not keeping up that appearance in their city. So that's a really neat thing. And I could, I think that that could possibly come to Halifax. Mm -hmm. Well, and certainly I know the dandelions are in full bloom right now in Halifax. And uh, it's really funny to me because we'll pay, we'll pay a premium for dandelion greens and things like that. And then we mow over all of this uh, stuff that could be potentially a good food source for us. I know, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Meredith. And um, if you're just tuning in now, Meredith just gave a, a great presentation um, about biodiversity in our cities. And uh, I wanted to invite folks that might just be joining us uh, and folks on Facebook Live, hello. Uh, we're hoping to increase our membership today. And so we're encouraging folks to join us in creating meaningful change for our environment by supporting the Ecology Action Center with a monthly or annual membership. Um, thank you to so much sorry, thank you so much to everybody who has joined so far. And if you haven't become a member yet, there's still time and you can just follow the link in the chat um, to help us today. Um, and thanks again, Meredith, for taking time out of your day. And thanks again to everybody whose presence and participation um, is here with us uh, today for our biodiversity webinar. Now, I can't believe it, it's already two o'clock and we're getting ready for our final presentation of the day. Um, I'm so excited to introduce you to our next presenter, Jordi Thompson. Jordi is EAC's Marine Science and Conservation Coordinator, and he's here today to highlight the unique marine biodiversity that we have here in our Atlantic waters. And uh, he's going to summarize how marine protected areas MPAs are being put in place to protect it. So thank you so much for being here, Jordy. All right, thanks, Dana. Thank you very much. And thanks both to uh, for great presentations. Um, I am muted now, unmuted. Okay, uh, I hope everybody can hear me now. I'm gonna share my screen and start with this slide here. Okay, so um, I wanted to start by echoing what something that Karen said um, to, to frame things in an optimistic light, because we, we all know that there are massive challenges that we're facing in terms of biodiversity, in terms of climate, uh, and of course the global health pandemic. Um, Karen, for those who maybe didn't see, highlighted some of the successes we previously had in challenging and in, in tackling some of these big challenges, pointing to uh, repairing the ozone layer in the 70s. And, um, I wanted to build on that by uh, telling you about some successes that we've had in the ocean as well. So, um, you know, sea turtle populations, for example, were really heavily harvested um, for centuries. Um, they lost lots of their nesting habitats due to development uh, and, and direct destruction and disturbance. In the 70s and 80s, a number of Western countries and others um, put limits or banned direct harvest and put uh, protections in place to protect their nesting beaches. And now we're seeing around the world uh, over the last 30 to 40 years, there are some really strong positive trends showing their populations rebounding. And the same can be said about some of the great whales that were protected after the whaling industry um, finished up. Um, for example, humpback whales in the Pacific. We have lots of challenges um, as illustrated by the, the situation with North Atlantic right whales out here in our waters, but there are some really good success stories as well. Um, so in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about um, another positive development that's happened over the last number of years, and that's the, the growing implementation of marine protected areas across the country to preserve not just the charismatic species like turtles and whales, but all of the really important biodiversity we have in our oceans. Um, so I wanted to start with a poll question just to get a sense for, for folks who are watching. Um, and the question is, what percentage of Canada's ocean do you think is currently protected.
And there is a range of options there. And the second question, follow-up, is what percentage do you think should be protected? If anybody was watching with a keen eye to Karen's presentation, uh, the answer was on one of her slides to the first question, but I'll be really curious to see what everybody thinks. And we should see some results coming in, hopefully. 11 to 20%, okay. 11 to 20% is the most common answer, less than one, some, some 21 to 30. Um, and how much should be protected? Oh, nice, okay. I'm gonna put you folks all in touch with our decision makers, especially those in the greater than 50% category. Um, okay, I won't give away the answers just yet, but they'll, they'll come in the next couple of slides. So what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what marine protected areas are, how they work, um, the progress that Canada's made over the last number of years. And in doing this, I'm gonna um, show you a number of photos that were taken by a really talented photographer that we contracted a couple years ago. His name's Nick Hawkins, he's based in New Brunswick, and he did a bunch of diving for us and just got some incredible images of the diversity of life that we have out here in our very productive and rich Atlantic waters. I like to start talks about uh, ocean health with, with this quote from um, the famous uh, ocean explorer, Sylvia Earle. With every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea. And it couldn't be more true. Over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from marine plants. Um, the oceans regulate our climate and have a central role to play in buffering us from the effects of climate change. And they also obviously provide us with an important food source uh, from fish, shellfish, uh, and other species that are consumed around the world. Unfortunately, uh, both in the news media and in the scientific literature, we're sort of, it's dominated by headlines like this right now. We see um, very strong downward trends in diversity in the oceans, in abundance in the oceans, and nearly a million species globally, as, as uh, Karen suggested in her presentation, are threatened with ext extinction, and that includes a lot of species in the ocean. And another challenge with the ocean is that we've just been, we've been doing the research in there for such a short period of time compared to on land that we don't even really know necessarily what's there and what the trends are. So there are things that we could be losing that we don't even know about. So this is a really important and pivotal, pivotal time for um, making sure that we start thinking differently about our activities in the oceans, how they influence ecosystems in life, and what tools we can use to protect them. So one of the tools that we can use uh, are, are protected areas. And these are geographically defined spaces that, that restrict certain human activities to benefit the life there. Um, and happily, Canada is a signatory uh, to the Convention on Biological Diversity and has agreed to hit 10% marine protection by 2020. This was a federal commitment. Um, and I'm happy to report that, you know, this is, is a very low target. We had to start somewhere. Um, and happy to report that uh, we are actually have uh, exceeded that um, target. So right now in the middle of 2020, we're at about 13.81%. And here this, this graph shows uh, overall progress. So it shows first terrestrial protected areas. That's the green line. So you can see fairly consistent, gradual process, quite slow um, from, the, from the early 90s. And down here are the blue lines are marine protected areas. Um, don't worry about the differences between the two, they're just different, different levels of protection, but you can see that there was really nothing in Canadian waters, less than 1% until about 2015, when our federal government made some of these commitments and then um, the proportion started jumping up. So this, this graph is a little bit dated, but we're in 2020 and we are somewhere up here around uh, nearing 14% protection. And happily, um, EAC is, has pushed our political leaders uh, leading up to the federal election to extend those targets and build on those commitments. And the, the government has committed now to protecting 25% of its oceans by 2025 with an ultimate goal of 30% protection by 2030. It's going to be a heavy lift, especially now as, as priorities have kind of shifted um, in response to the COVID crisis. Um, but we still see a, a good opportunity to, to hit this target uh, within the next five years. And we're working strongly to, uh, towards that. So backing up a second, um, what exactly is a marine protected area? Well, 
Obviously, it's very similar to terrestrial protected areas. It's a geographically divine, defined space that is designed to protect the species and their habitats, uh, species that live there and their habitats. Now, in the oceans, there's a, an added challenge compared to terrestrial ecosystems. Things are much more, forgive the term, much more fluid in the oceans. There's a lot more movement. Um, you know, some fish populations, some sea turtles and sharks, those kinds of species can cover entire ocean basins over the course of their their lives and over the course of you know migratory cycles within a single year even so it's it can be much more di difficult um, but there are a lot of more sedentary species that need protection and need threats mitigated and so MPAs can be particularly effective for those species and these areas restrict or prohibit certain human activities but still allow sustainable human uses so right now federal marine protected areas in Canada um, we have new standards that were announced last year that ban things like oil and gas bottom trawling mining and dumping the really big heavy and damaging industrial activities. But they still allow in certain areas within protected areas sustainable uses like sustainable and small scale forms of fishing. We all know how important fishing is to the culture here to a coastal livelihoods in our economy. Um, so as long as the fishing activities don't damage the sustainability and the, the long term longevity of the species. Uh, we, we think that that's okay. Most protected areas have different zoning. So there'll be a good chunk of the protected area that where you can't do most things. And then some areas where uh, small scale commercial uses are allowed. Now, even for those really highly mobile species like sharks, like tunas, et cetera, um, while we can't protect anywhere near the whole range for the species, we can protect certain important feeding or breeding sites. So these are sites that have particular importance to different uh, life stages. Uh, so some species have very defined feeding areas that they migrate to every year. We can target some of those for protection and have benefit for the species. Now, protected areas are limited in that in, in the sense that, you know, drawing one small box into one small chunk of the ocean isn't going to solve our big pressing issues. But if we approach this from a network perspective, where we have a connected network of these small sites throughout the ocean, we can help build um, capacity for more resilience in our oceans to, to fight different stressors. And right now, obviously, the biggest one is climate change. So we can build resilience in our oceans through a connected, connected network of these protected areas. So zooming into Atlantic Canada, um, this map comes from a really, really cool resource called mpatlas.org. Anybody is free to go there. It is a global interactive map that tracks our progress in marine protected areas. So you can zoom into different regions and all of these different boxes that you see here are different types of protected areas, some at different stages. You can zoom into each one, you can click on it. It'll give you information about its size, when it was put into place, what it was put there for. Um, so I'd encourage everybody when you have a chance just to go and play around with it. It's a really, really neat tool. Um, and for the second half of this presentation, I'm going to go through some of the sites that we have proposed or in place here in Atlantic Canada, and then profile some of the species that we would, are likely to find. So we'll start with our coastal areas. You'll notice that there isn't a lot of coastal protection in, in most of Nova Scotia. It's, it's a very challenging thing to do because there are, is a, a quite a long legacy of, of human use in these areas. And so it's, it's a challenging thing to do, but there are species there that we need to protect um, so let's take a look at some of those. So for Nova Scotia, obviously lobster is king. It's king for, is key to our, to our economy, to our communities. Um, but another and perhaps less well appreciated species is the green stuff in the background here. And this is one of my favorites. This is eelgrass. And eelgrass is really important for a whole variety of reasons. And we have another poll question here, I believe. I'm curious to see what people think. Um, are the different ecological roles that eelgrass plays in our coastal ecosystems. So a bunch of different options here. Bus bu buffering coastlines from storms and erosion, providing nursery habitat for commercially fished species, helping to fight climate change by sequestering carbon. Um, is it repeated there and improving water clarity by, by trapping sediments or all of the above. And all of the above. All right, I, this is a pretty easy question, I guess. But uh, I'm, I'm really glad to see that, that folks are aware of it. Um, 
Seagrasses, you know, they don't tend to get the same attention that uh, colorful things like corals and coral reefs get, but they are just as important in, in our coastal ecosystems. Uh, and they are also in crisis around the world. They're declining at a rapid rate because of development, because of hard shoreline structures that increase erosion. Um, so it's really, really important for us to understand their importance and put measures in place to protect them. There are also other forms of vegetation along our coastline, and these will be familiar to a lot of people, uh, things like rockweed and other types of algae and kelps. So between these and seagrasses, these are the foundation species. These are the species that create the physical structure that entire food webs depend upon. So it's really important that they're um, maintained and protected in order to, to maintain the integrity of the ecosystem as a whole. Um, this is another shot showing some of the small shoaling fish that uh, make their homes in these, in these areas. And these fish are obviously uh, food for larger fish. They're food for the great whales. Um, so from a bottom-up perspective, this is where we have to start with our, with our protections. And there are also uh, a number of charismatic species that come close to our shorelines, like this harbor porpoise. They're particularly common in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and protected areas can help um, set aside some space for these, these folks. So um, I'll just point out one site on the map here. This is Eastern Shore Islands area of interest. So this is a proposed protected area. It is not in place yet. Um, it is going through the consultation process. It's gonna be a bit of a long haul. You've probably seen some, some media around that, but that is one coastal site that is um, hopefully going to be put in place to protect, uh, among other things, eelgrass beds and, and the species that live there. Now, if we move a little bit further offshore, we'll see over the banks, there are quite a number of different sites. And I'll highlight this one here. This is St. Anne's Bank Marine Protected Area. And this was established in 2017. And this, this area is really fascinating to me. I think, you know, when we think about Atlantic reefs and Atlantic life in deeper water, we don't tend to think of really vibrant, colorful communities. We tend to think of that in tropical areas with coral reefs. But when you look at some of the stuff that's actually found in these areas, there is an incredible diversity of very, very vibrant um, uh, life, vibrant species. So these are uh, anemones that are uh, grounded in the seafloor. They're particularly common on rocky reefs. Uh, they're related to jellyfish. They have little stinging and hooking cells in these arms that trap little particles of food and then funnel them down towards their, their mouth. Um, this here is called a sea squirt, um, and it is a slightly different feeding tactic. And again, it's, it's sedentary, uh, but it filters water in through what's called a siphon, which is this here and this here. And as it filters water through its body, it traps small particles of food to eat. There are sponges here uh, of different varieties and urchins, which are little, they're herbivores. So they feed on plant life, algae and kelp, uh, such as kelp and other things. Um, this sort of uh, alien scape is a, 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 a grove of sea squirts. So these are stocked sea squirts that root to the bottom. They have the stock up to the main body where they can access strong or stronger ocean currents and they can filter water that way. This is a shot of uh, another species of anemone, but also tons of ski sea squirts, some soft corals in there, sponges, sea stars. I mean, it just kind of blew my mind when I saw this because I, I hadn't really fully appreciated the, the colorful diversity of life that we have here just off of our shorelines. And here we have uh, a wolffish, which is endangered, living under a rocky reef, along with this guy, which is a sea, sea cucumber, and more of these stocked sea urchins. So these are just examples of the reefs over these banks that we have here in Nova Scotia. Now, we also have uh, some very charismatic species at the surface in these deeper waters, like this minke whale. So a minke whale is a baleen whale. And what it's doing here is leaping up at the surface, uh, feeding on schooling fish. It'll take a big gulp of, of water and fish, squeeze the water out through its baleen and swallow, and swallow the fish. Uh, very commonly found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, in the Bay of Fundy, and as well as off of the Nova Scotia coast. And of course, most people will be familiar with the North Atlantic right whale, highly endangered, only about 400 or so individuals left. And they tend to summer up in our waters and feed on plankton. Now, lastly, we'll move to sort of the, uh, the deeper offshore areas. So you'll notice um, we don't have a lot of protection out here in the really, really deep areas, but we do have um, 
the green box here is the, the Gully Marine Protected Area. So that is the first marine protected area in Nova Scotia. It's now 15 years old and it protects this canyon that was carved out by um, glacial meltwater and that has depths up to two to three kilometers that include a whole bunch of different um, species. And here we go. So these are cold water corals. So we do actually have very abundant, very colorful coral reefs in Canada. They just happen to be in extremely deep, extremely cold water. Um, this is a bubblegum coral as well as some other species and they create habitat for sea stars, for crab, for shrimps, as well as for uh, deep water fish. Um, so you can imagine something like bottom trawl fishing that just drags a bar across the bottom and destroys, wipes out everything in its path. Um, the amount of damage that that can do. And these are very slow growing, very long lived species. And so recovery from that kind of disturbance could be 10 years or a couple decades or more. Um, so these are some of the vibrant ecosystems that we have out there that protected areas can protect by excluding those kinds of harmful industrial activities. Now offshore in these areas, there are also a lot of the big um, pelagic or open ocean species that, that migrate large distances, like such as this um, bluefin tuna, uh, pilot whales, blue shark, which is one of the more common shark species we have in our waters. And this handsome fella, which is uh, a mola mola. This is an ocean sunfish. Um, one of the just look at this thing and just kind of wonder how this ever <laughs> ever happened. We're so obsessed with finding alien life on uh, other planets, you know, but then you look in our ocean and you see something like this. Uh, it's just an ocean wanderer and uh, sometimes you can see them uh, and their fins breaking the surface here in our in our waters offshore of Nova Scotia. So I'll, I'll wrap up just by saying that um, marine protected areas are one tool in our toolbox. We also have to be better at managing our fisheries about 25% of our fish stocks are in unhealthy condition right now. We need to make sure that they are rebuilt and those fisheries are sustainably managed. Um, but the cornerstone of successful conservation has to be these spatial protections where we just don't go in certain areas, we restrict activities in other areas. But it's important to be careful about where we place them because this has to be traded off with some of the coastal livelihoods that we want to support. And we want to encourage sustainable use and stewardship as well to make sure our communities and economies here are very healthy. Um, so with that on, on biodiversity, I hope that's given you a little bit of an overview of some of the incredible species we have out there and some of the progress that's being made towards protecting them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jordy. And we have a bunch of questions coming in. I feel like I've learned so much in the last 15 minutes between mola mola and sea squirts and uh, eelgrass. I just have a whole bunch of new uh, names of species that I want to talk about with all of my friends. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a few questions right now. Robert Wallace, Bob Wallace, is wondering uh, what's the largest obstacle to having the marine protected area enacted? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. Um, I think the largest obstacle is that we did everything in the wrong order. <laughs> so, so if we came in with a blank slate to a new place, you know, the first thing we should be doing is saying, okay, we're just going to identify ecologically sensitive areas, setting them aside for protection, and then building up our, our economic base with activities around those. But unfortunately, we have, you know, centuries of, of, um, of use in different areas. And so the process is, it's, it's a complicated and slow negotiation with all different stakeholders. Mm. And that, that means, you know, the fishing industry, the oil and gas industry, the provincial government, federal governments, indigenous communities, NGOs, the whole works. And so just in general, um, it's a slow and, and um, kind of a, a messy process. Um, but I think the more public attention there is and public awareness for the need for protection there is, the more pressure there is on our decision makers to get these things done and the faster it's going to happen. Um, so we're very happy to see the progress that's been made um, and excited to keep working towards that that uh, 25%. Great, thank you. And you know we, we are talking so much about marine protected areas. We got a question that um, you know, really, I think maybe we don't all know the answer to, which is what are protected areas actually protected from? 
Oh, okay. Well, it depends on the type of protected area. There are various levels of protection. So as of April in 2019, every new federal marine protected area, this is, um, these are under, established under the Oceans Act, are protected from uh, bottom trawl fishing, from seabed mining, from oil and gas drilling, and, um, and, and a few other industrial activities. Then within that, there is scope to zone each protected area to allow certain uses, um, provided that a risk assessment is done by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and they deem that there's low risk uh, of that particular activity. Then there are other types of protected areas, um, for example, things called marine refuges under the Fisheries Act, and they primarily just manage fishing impacts. So they, they can keep uh, bottom trawl fishing out of some areas, but they don't have jurisdiction over other types of uses. So there's kind of a, um, a hierarchy of strength of protection. Um, and at the high end, the Oceans Act new federal MPAs, which we're really excited about, are provide the strongest. Mm. Um, Guy is wondering, what's with all the harvesting of rockweed? Seems to be devastating uh, habitat. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, a great question and important topic. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but definitely, Guy, I could put you in touch with someone who is and who could answer your questions about, about that industry and the license holders and, uh, and the regulations around that. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, another question from Guy just came in as well about the impact of marine protected areas and aquaculture. Is there a connection there? Is it separate? Right. So, so right now, um, the the standards for federal marine protected areas don't um, exclude aquaculture necessarily, but that would come in in the risk assessment for a particular site. So, if we're thinking about salmon aquaculture, for example, in a coastal area, if there's a risk deemed to the ecosystem from that activity, then it could be excluded by a protected area. But it's a that's a case by case kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. Other forms of aquaculture, like some of the shellfish, are are, are um, uh, less of concern, perhaps, than uh, open net pen fin, fin fish aquaculture. Yeah. We have a question from Facebook from Marin asking about how many times a year is the floor trawled? That's a really big question. Wow, that, yeah, that is a good question. Um, and I actually don't, don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm sure we could get some information on, on historical patterns of bottom trawling. Um, but essentially, once it's trawled once, um, you know, the, the, the habitat forming structures like the corals and sponges, as I was mentioning, those take a long time to come back. So uh, once there's a footprint of trawling there, the actual ecological recovery is going to take a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Jordi, for answering all of our big questions about the ocean today and for teaching us so much about all the biodiversity within it. Um, this actually concludes EAC's first ever Biodiversity Day webinar. So thank you so much to all of our panelists and participants for making today possible. It was really awesome to um, get to learn so much from everybody and also to have such a great conversation with our community. We really like that we're able to connect with you this way. And I'm sure we'll continue to have webinars um, so that you can continue to learn more about all the great work that the Ecology Action Center is doing. Um, and again, uh, if you haven't joined already as a member, um, but you maybe tuned into this presentation, you learned something, you enjoyed it, you said, hey, I want to take action and, you know, join this really amazing group that's doing incredible work to protect biodiversity, uh, simply follow the link in the chat. Uh, we would love to have you join our organization as a member. We have over 5,000 individuals who know that being a member makes a difference and helps to make our voice in advocating for things like biodiversity protection even more impactful. Um, personally, I've been a EAC member for over seven years now, and I love that I'm constantly learning about different environmental issues, uh, both the challenges and the successes and the opportunities as we largely discussed today. Uh, and I love being a part of a wider community of folks like everybody here taking time out of their day today that knows that when it comes to making change, we are stronger when we're together. And um, so with that, 
Uh, I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I hope you get outside and get to experience some of the biodiversity around you and that you can stay safe and well. So thank you so much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your uh, International Day of Biological Diversity. <laughs> Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks Dana. Thank you.